Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Graham Pike, and I'm uh, Dean of International Education here at BIU. And I'd like to first acknowledge our presence on the traditional lands of the, the Sunamo First Nations. On behalf of the colloquium organizers, I'd like to thank the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Ross McKay, and his staff for their support of the colloquium series. I'd also like to thank the theater for hosting us and providing technical support and the Media Research Lab for filming the event. I'm uh, very pleased, uh, I was very pleased to be invited to say a few words at the beginning of this particular collo colloquium um, because it has, uh, the, the topic is of great personal interest uh, to, to me. In August 1980, uh, I participated in a UNESCO study tour of Polish arts and culture at the Jagiellonian University in the beautiful city of Krakow in, in southern Poland. And that, it was a, a memorable event in many ways. Uh, it, firstly, it introduced me to the enormous pride of the Polish people in their very rich uh, cultural heritage, from the, the architectural magnificence of the city of Krakow to the amazing salt sculptures that were carved by the, the miners deep down underground in the salt mines. It was also memorable in that uh, what I witnessed was uh, a delicate dance by the presenters at this uh, study tour around Polish nationalism. On the one hand, they wanted to express their enormous pride in Polish history and culture, but on the other, they didn't dare cross the official line of the Communist Party. It was also memorable because, uh, and this was August 1980, at that very time that I was in Krakow, in the northern city of Gdansk, uh, an unknown electrician by the name of Lech Wałęsa was climbing the walls of the shipyards and protesting against the, the communist movement, uh, a protest that led fairly quickly to the formation of, of the Solidarność or, or Solidarity protest group and which led eventually, uh, within a decade, to the demise of the Soviet Union. And as I reflect on that experience in Poland in, in 1980, uh, I reflect on the place of the arts and culture in defining who we are, especially when who we are or I, our identity is under threat. And I think we've seen that many times uh, in other European, particularly Eastern, Eastern European nations, and indeed, indeed around the world, when identity is perceived to be under threat, uh, the culture, the arts become even more important. However, as my own career has developed, that has posed for me a particular dilemma, because my career has been focused on the pursuit of another ideal, and that is the ideal of global citizenship which in, in some ways is a, a critique of nationalism, or at least a critique of some forms of nationalism. But I have to accept, I think, that who we are, that our essential identity is tied to place, uh, and that place is often where we were born or, or where we have been brought up. And I'm reminded of, of something that Michael Ignatieff said many years ago when he's, he talked about the global village and he said, you know, all this talk about the global village, not many of us actually choose to live in that global village. We choose to live in places where we can be surrounded by people who are like us, or at least where we can be surrounded by our own culture, our own heritage, because it gives us that, that sense of belonging that, that we so need. Or as another writer has put it, the global village has no address. So I see this as also uh, a dance, uh, a continuous and not always fluid pas de deux in which one dancer is, represents the forces of national identity, that sense of belonging, that sense of being tied to a place. And the other dancer represents a vision of a global community, uh, a dream of a, of a better world. And this is where I think the arts and humanities are so important in helping 
uh, to teach those complex dance steps that on the one hand celebrate the arts and culture, uh, acknowledge their power in, in determining our sense of belonging, our identity, but also embrace the need to, to break down the walls that nationalism can very easily construct, the walls that lead to prejudice, to fear, to discrimination, and eventually to conflict. And so I was heartened uh, very recently, in fact last week, to read <coughs> of a new declaration uh, called the Leiden Statement, uh, a statement that has been put together by uh, a leading group of universities from around the world, including many Canadian universities. Uh, and it was uh, written and declared at, at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And it's a statement on the importance of social sciences and humanities uh, in terms of uh, education around essential global well-being. And I would certainly include the arts in, in that as well. And just to read you a little bit from this statement, the social sciences and humanities disciplines play a crucial role in teaching us how to understand, interpret, and respect our commonalities and our differences. A peaceful and sustainable future based on successful economic and societal development requires the ability to acknowledge and respect different perspectives that flows from an understanding of diverse cultures, histories, and social institutions. Mutual understanding can foster a peaceful and stable world order in which economic and societal progress is possible. And I think that statement and those values underscore uh, much of what we do here at VIU and certainly underscore this uh, Arts and Humanities Colloquium. So now I'd like to invite uh, Katerina Rout, uh, a longtime member of the English Department at Vancouver Island University, uh, who will introduce our two speakers. It is my pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleagues, Terry Doughty and Dr. Justin McGrail to you. And it is a special honor to be able to do that in the presence of our new chancellor, Chancellor Luis Mendel. Welcome. Your presence is a potent reminder for us that we have a shared commitment at VIU to the well-being of indigenous and non-indigenous students, staff, and faculty alike. And one of the expressions of that commitment is the existence of a building on campus that we call the Gathering Place. Now, today we are going to hear about Wroclaw, city in Poland, but the motto of that city is similar. It's called the Meeting Place. And while our talk today will take us to Poland, it will also address issues that we face right here in Anaimo. How can we live in a place where we make room for difference and yet build community? How can we remember a past that so often was violent and painful? And most importantly, what is needed for reconciliation? In the past decade, I had the privilege to participate in two Canadian studies conferences in Poland. And I was moved by the genuine interest of our Polish colleagues in us, in Canada. How do you practice multiculturalism, they asked. What do you do to get along? We need to learn from you. Today, we can learn from them. Terry Doughty teaches Victorian literature, children's literature, and literature of the fantastic. She has edited scholarly books in these fields and has published on children's and young adult fantasy literature, on British new woman fiction and journalism, and on girls' empire adventure stories. Of particular interest to us today, however, is her work presenting papers at conferences and symposia in Poland, and her work as an editorial consultant for a Polish literature a journal on literature and popular culture. Terry has taught courses in Polish literature for us, and looks forward to a new course on Central European literature in January, to which you are warmly invited. Justin McGrail studied art and architectural history at McGill, 
and earned his PhD in art history at the University of Victoria. He teaches art history, criticism, and art theory in our Department of Art and Design, and has published on big box stores or the new retail architecture in Canada. A few weeks ago, he gave a paper to the University Art Association of Canada at its annual conference in Toronto about building Wroclaw out of Breslau, material related to what you will hear today. Along with his academic work, Justin is a spoken word poet with over 20 years of performance experience in Canada and the United States. And if you are a longtime friend of the Arts and Humanities Colloquium, you will remember his brilliant performance for us in 2010. Please welcome Terry Doughty and Dr. Justin McGrail. Welcome, Louise Heichka, for your service to Bank Around University. We look forward to seeing you here on campus more. Uh, and thank you uh, to Graham and Katarina for those insightful introductions. Uh, in addition to the thanks that Graham has already made, we would also like to thank Audrey Hansen and the, those in international education who supported our field school as well as our students for exploring Wroclaw with us. Vitami Panstvo. Welcome all. We do not speak Polish well. <laughs> so please, please excuse our Anglo accents. When Justin and I speak about our experiences in Wroclaw, we usually get two responses. First, people ask where Wroclaw is. And then they ask why an English or art history professor would want to go there. So we're going to begin with some background. Wroclaw is Poland's fourth largest city, the capital of Lower Silesia, near the country's western border. If you look on the map, uh, it is in the lower left near the Czech Republic border. It's on the Odra River before World War II. It was the German eastern border city of Breslau. Poland had not existed as a nation after the partitions of the late 18th century when Russia, Prussia, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire gobbled up Polish lands. It was reconstituted as a nation after World War I in the breaking up of the Russian, German, and Habsburg empires. After World War II, Churchill and Roosevelt allowed Stalin to keep the Polish land he had taken while allied with Hitler and the Potsdam Conference gave Poland German lands in recompense. The Lost Kresy, the eastern borderlands, were replaced by the Zmia Ajiskana, the recovered territories, a new western borderland including Wroclaw, called recovered because of the, many, the, the medieval rule of the region by a Polish Piast dynasty. Like many North Americans, I knew nothing about the city before attending a conference on the fantastic in children's and young adult literature in 2008 at the University of Wroclaw. Working myself on liminal or betwixt and between spaces and fantasy, I was fascinated by the number of Polish scholars who were interested in blurred boundaries and transcultural values, similar to those Katarina met who were interested in collaboration and cooperation. When I came home, I came across a novel by a friend from Toronto, Eva Stachniak, who had grown up in Wroclaw. In Necessary Lies, the main character, Anna, is a Polish woman from Wroclaw who comes to Montreal to study and falls in love with a German man, originally from Breslau. Only in Canada can these two people, from the same physical location, yet separate worlds, meet and fall in love. When she discovers William has kept secrets from her, she journeys back to Wroclaw to come to terms with her past and his. It is a moving narrative that makes clear that both Poles and Germans, coming to terms with their tumultuous 20th century history, have had need of the Lebenslug, a term Anna is taught by her German husband and which is retranslated by a German woman in the novel as the lie we tell in order to live with ourselves. 
to live with our pasts. I began teaching this novel and had many students say they wished the class could visit Wroclaw. This gave me the idea for a field school using the city as a teaching space to explore the issues that arise in the places where cultures come into contact with one another. Because the course would be focused on the idea of a cultural contact zone, I wanted it to be interdisciplinary. So I approached Justin and lured him with promises of interesting architecture and art. He was also fascinated with the ways the city rebuilt itself after the war and agreed to co-lead the field school, which we ran in 2012 and 2014. When I told Eva about the field school focus on the city as a cultural contact zone, she wrote back to me that, quote, borders have always been important for Poles. We had them change too often not to ponder on their meeting meanings, end quote. One of my favorite Polish poets, the Nobel laureate Wisława Szymborska, has a deceptively simple poem called Psalm that opens with a provocative statement about borders. Oh, the leaky boundaries of man-made states. How many clouds float past them with impunity. How much desert sand shifts from one land to another. How many mountain pebbles tumble onto foreign soil in provocative hops. This can be read different ways, as a statement of the futility of human attempts to order the natural world, as a rebellion against a totalitarian state that uses borders to contain its subjects, but above all, as an insistence on the porousness of borders. We usually think of borders as lines to demarcate, to cut one thing off from another. However, as border studies has shown, border zones, the areas on each side of a border, can be, in the words of German scholar Sabine Brook, a place where, quote, practices of cultural fusion might be enjoyed in difference, end quote. Historically, Wroclaw was very much a cultural contact zone. As Wratysla, it was tied to Poland, the ruling city of Silesia from around the year 1000 to around 1335, and was populated by Slavs, immigrant German peoples from Saxony, Thuringia, and Bavaria, immigrant Walloon weavers, and Jews. When Silesia was ceded to Bohemia in 1335, the city became Wroclaw. And from 1387 to 1515, it belonged to the Hanseatic League, an alliance of trading cities and merchant guilds, and became a center for many people to meet and mingle. During this period, the city retained its multi-ethnic composition. When the Habsburgs added Bohemia to their territories in 1526, the city was renamed Presla. Essentially Germanic by this time, it retained a small popu Polish population. The city became Breslau when Prussia invaded and conquered Silesia in 1741. With the advent of the German Empire in 1871, the city lost an S from its name and a slight difference in pronunciation. As a border city, it experienced some tensions in its mixed population of Germans, Poles, Jews, and Czechs, exacerbated by the hypernationalisms of the late 19th and first half of the 20th century. Tensions among the city's multi-ethnic populations would become flashpoints of conflict and catastrophe in the 20th century all part of the chain of events that is familiar to us which linked the First and the Second World Wars. As Terry mentioned at the start, the reconstitution of Poland in 1918 and the redrawing of its borders in 1945 were events that had enormous consequences for different ethnic populations in Eastern Europe. The shifting of borders that were formalized at the Potsdam Conference made the city part of the newly declared People's Republic of Poland, along with most of Silesia, dubbed the Recovered Territories, as a way of referencing the city's medieval history and Piast roots. Ensuing propaganda campaigns led by the newly formed Ministry of the Recovered Territories would stress Poland's historical claims to the formerly German lands and focused on culturally Polonizing the territories. And this was especially true in the case of the city of Wroclaw. The redrawn borders of 1945 precipitated forced migrations in Eastern Europe on an unprecedented scale. Historian R.M. Douglas has called it, quote, the largest forced population transfer and perhaps the single greatest movement of peoples in all of human history. 
Between 1945 and 1947, it is now estimated that as many as 12 to 14 million people were forcibly moved and resettled in areas of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, Hungary, Russia, and Germany. Actions that carried on the notions of ethnic self-determination which had informed the Treaty of Versailles and much of the diplomacy in the interwar periods. The idea of creating ethnically homogeneous nation states as a means of reducing conflict, despite being thoroughly discredited by the events of the Second World War, endured after 1945 in cruel and chaotic campaigns of ethnic cleansing. Given the scale of these expulsions, to say nothing of the physical and psychological devastation wrought by six years of war, it's not surprising that Poland's recovered territories were sites of terror, dislocation, and crime. Poles called it Juke Zod, the Wild West. For Poland's impoverished communist government, the new lands were considered spoils of war, meant to be a source of wealth and material needed for the construction of the People's Republic. The region's German history and identity was something to be rewritten or removed. A program of Polonization, also known as de-Germanization, was launched almost immediately and which included vandalism, looting, and deconstruction amongst its instruments of cultural demolition. The pillaging of the city by Soviet and German forces during and immediately after the fighting, which concluded in May of 1945, was followed by months of official patriotic shabir by Polish authorities from outside of Wroclaw. Translated, the Polish word shabir falls somewhere between looting and scavenging. The government and cities of Poland needed tools and materials for the reconstruction, and Wroclaw, and Silesia in general, was to be their quarry for furniture, machinery, radios, typewriters, books, and office equipment. All of the city's intact pianos were gathered and sent to Krakow, while the city's still working streetcars went to Warsaw. In what is perhaps the best known example of patriotic Shabir, the Polish capital, parts of which had been famously destroyed during the war, also received bricks and building materials from Wroclaw as part of a national campaign entitled, The Entire Nation is Rebuilding Its Capital. While authorities in part saw the collection of bricks and reuse of materials as an effective way to clear Wroclaw of rubble left from the siege, there quickly developed a lucrative trade in bricks that fueled the collection campaign and left new rubble behind. When in 1949, the Directorate of Municipal Reconstruction was reorganized as the Municipal Demolition Enterprise, the Bricks for Warsaw campaign intensified. As a result, buildings that had been lightly damaged in the war were now torn down for their materials. In 1955, the focus on destruction and not reconstruction became clear by the appropriately entitled, quote, Demolition Decree Number 666 which increased the city's contribution to the brick campaign while also adding to the rubble and debris in the city. At its peak, the campaign saw 165 million bricks annually shipped to the capital, along with stone decorative features, some of which are visible today in Warsaw's Old Town. As a result of the brick campaign by 1955, and this is a photograph of 1955, not 1945, the amount of debris and rubble in the city was close to what it had been at the end of the war. The battle to clear and clean the streets and against the vermin and disease that occupied the refuse continued into the 1960s. The Ministry of the Recovered Territories Polonization Mandate had four goals. The elimination of the use of the German language, removal of all German inscriptions, the Polonizing of first and last names, and the eradication of all forms of Nazi ideology. The removal of all visible traces of Germandun in the city included inscriptions, signs, street names, municipal catalogs, city records, funerary plaques, and monuments. This ethnic erasure was seen as a crucial means for solidifying Poland's claim to the city, which, even after Potsdam, was seen by many as tenuous. A feeling of impermanence cast a shadow over Polish efforts to make the city feel like home, something exacerbated by the fact 
that municipal directives and ordinances were written using German typewriters and typed onto the back of German stationery, a situation that was not rectified until 1948. Public monuments, large and small, were obvious ta targets for ethnic erasure and included statues of German monarchs and prominent citizens. This plinth is what remains of the Nor Fountain, a memorial to Johann Friedrich Nor, a building commissioner who, in the early 19th century, had designed the promenade that was built over Breslau's dismantled fortifications. The memorial, which was unveiled in 1878, was vandalized on an unknown date after 1945. On March 7, 1947, the newspaper Slovo Polski announced, quote, we are removing the vestiges of Germandom, a campaign in which prizes would be awarded to citizens who remove the most German text from sight. In her diary entry of 1947, Wroclaw citizen Joanna Komenitsky wrote, quote, Almost every newspaper reminds us of the need to eradicate German inscriptions from public buildings, shop signs, wherever they appear. This is completely understandable, because if we encounter inscriptions in a foreign language at every step, it constantly reminds us of the Germanness of the city that we wish to embrace as our own. In the months preceding the exhibition of the recovered territories, a fair intended to celebrate the Polishness of the formerly German lands scheduled for July of 1948. The eraser of Germandon increased with the destruction of monuments, the dismantling of funerary memorials, and the removal of all German place names. The exhibition was held on the site of the Centennial Hall, designed by Max Berg in 1913 to mark the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Leipzig, and which was renamed the Halle Ladova, the fittingly communist People's Hall. In front, we see the Iglika, the Needle, which is Stanislaw Hempel's 96-meter-tall spire built for the exhibition, and which is the only monument in Wroclaw today that actually commemorates the border shifts of 1945. At the height of the Polonization campaign, anything bearing German text was a target, including funerary monuments. Cemeteries were declared parks, and headstones were collected and repurposed as masonry supply for the rebuilding efforts. On the exterior walls of the city's major churches, epitaphs were smashed or had their dedicatory bronze plaques removed, leaving behind multiple examples of eerie framed blankness. Well, Historians have today suggested that the Catholic Polish citizens were uncomfortable with such desecration. It's, uh, such actions, sorry, were also part of the conversion of Protestant churches into Catholic ones. The vandalized church epitaphs were among the most visible legacy of the Polonization campaign in Wroclaw. For art historians, funerary monuments and memento mori themes constitute a familial realm of study. The blank epitaphs of Wroclaw convey a chilling variation on remembrance. That is, after death comes a loss of memory. That remembrance is a fragile thing, and that death seems to be a void. Memento more becomes memento nilo. The reminder of death is a reminder of nothingness. When individual dedications are lost, monuments become generalized and self-referential. They become memorials about memorials. Historian Gregor Toom argues that Polonization campaign actually worked against the establishment of Polish roots in Wroclaw, as it demonstrated the fragile solidity of regional identity and exposed the results of much derp Germanization as shallow window dressing. The disconnect between everyday life in Wroclaw and the propaganda of the Ministry of Recovered Territories fueled an impermanence syndrome felt by Poles living in the city. Many assumed it, along with the rest of the recovered territories, would be returned to Germany in due course. Impermanence and Polonization maintained a high level of cultural dislocation amongst city residents. In the words of Polish writer Andrzej Zawada, quote, Wroclaw is a city with an amputated memory. It is hard for us to imagine what it would be like to try to live in such a place and time. For instance, author Stanislaw Nowinski described his childhood 
experience as a Pole living in Wroclaw. Quote, I slept on a German bed, looked at German pictures on the walls, bathed in a German bathtub, ate from German pots and dishes, played with German so swords, wrote with a German pen and German ink, leafed through German books. We were raised in hatred and fear of the Germans from childhood, and at the same time, our entire world, the entire cosmos of everyday life, even our tastes, were shaped by the realm of these German things." End quote. Historians have described how the impermanent syndrome worked against the government campaigns to make the city Polish, and that the official silence about Wroclaw's German and multi-ethnic history made the discomforting anxiety of Poles worse, something that began to subside only with the signing of treaties between Polish and German governments in 1970 and 1994 that recognized the borders and effectively renounced any of Germany's territorial claims. Generally, the post-war ethnic cleansings and population migrations were not acceptable topics in the literature of communist Poland, particularly in the period of aggressive polonization immediately after the war, but continuing into the 1980s. The poet Adam Zagajewski had been a noted dissident in communist Poland, but after martial law was declared in 1981, he exiled himself to Paris. In the title poem of his 1986 volume, To Go to Lvov, he writes of the city in which he was born, now Lviv in Ukraine, but which he knows only through family members, as his family was forced after the war to move to the recovered territories, to Gliwice, Poland, formerly German Gliwice and this is just a bit south of Wroclaw. Many of his former friends felt betrayed and puzzled by his seeming rejection of politics for nostalgia. Quote, to go to Lvov, which station for Lvov, if not in a dream at dawn, when dew gleams on a suitcase, when express trains and bullet trains are being born, to leave in haste for Lvov, night or day in September, or in March, but only if Lvov exists, if it is to be found within the frontiers and not just in my new passport. The American critic Marianne Hirsch has coined the term post-memory to describe, quote, the relationship that the generation after bears to the personal, collective, and cultural trauma of those who came before, to experiences they remember only by means of the stories, images, and behaviors among which they grew up. But these experiences were transmitted to them so deeply and effectively as to seem to constitute memories in their own right. Post-memory's connection to the past is thus actually mediated not by recall, but by imaginative investment, projection, and creation." End quote. Clearly, to go to Lvov, is an expression of post-memory, and post-memory would come to be a dominant feature in Polish literature of the 1990s, after the fall of communism, as writers began to reconstitute the Polish pre-communist past. Notable authors, and I'm focusing on those available in English translation, include the following. Stefan Hvin, born in Gdansk, to migrant parents, a father from Vilna, mother from the Warsaw area, so the father from what is now uh, Lithuanian Vilnius, uh, writes about the city of Gdansk, uh, and while his post-memory would give him the memories of the Polish people who came into that city after the war, he actually focuses his novel on a German who chose to stay in the city after the war. Pavel Huela, born near Gdansk to a family from Lvov, also writes about the different cultural groups in and around the Gdansk area, uh, the German past, um, the ethnic uh, minorities of the region. Andrzej Staszek has now settled in the Czech-Polish border region, and he writes frequently about uh, areas that are border spaces in Poland. He's also particularly interested in the Roma people, both in and outside of Poland. Marek Krajewski, born in Wrocław, writes of German Breslau. And Olga Tokarczuk, born near Zlonogora, lived for a time in Wrocław, now lives near Novoruda, 
And the two novels I've put here by her uh, are both border zone novels. Primeval is set in the Cressy, the eastern borderlands, and the second novel, House of Day, House of Night, is set near Vratzwaff. I'm going to speak briefly about Krajewski, whose inclusion here may be controversial as he's a writer of popular mysteries, and more onto Karczuk. But first I want to follow up on the idea of post-memory by addressing what Polish critic Przemyslav Czaplinski calls the mythic homeland in contemporary Polish prose. He establishes a convention of the mythic homeland, historically a multicultural, tolerant place where one is both conscious of one's identity linked to place and mindful of the permanence of place. The writers of the 1990s, and by the way, the dates I've given here are the dates of first Polish publication, uh, the, uh, diverge from these conventions in three important ways. Quote, the archaeology of individual memory replaces sociology, and the palimpsest takes the place of the single unequivocal historical record. The myth of the self-sufficient molecule replaces the myth dominant for so many years of the broken fragment that seeks to rejoin its whole, end quote. As he goes on to say, there is a transition from the homeland narrative to the narrative homeland. In other words, the homeland is created through narrative and multiple narratives at that. Krajewski shocked Poles with the publication of Death in Breslau in 1999, as it presented a narrative of the city's German past that had long been suppressed. Set in Breslau in 1933, it follows Inspector Eberhard Mock as he works to solve the grotesque murder of two women on a train. Reading it must have been a defamiliarizing experience for those who know Ratzwaff. The novel is full of what seemed to be unnecessary description of travel routes and locations. Quote, Mock did not try to persuade him and, quietly singing an operatic area to himself, drove across Emperor Bridge, past the municipal gym in the park where Heinrich Gopert, the founder of the Botanical Garden, stood on a plinth, left the Dominican church on his right and the main post office on his left, and drove into beautiful Albrechtstrasse, which started at the huge mass of the Hatzfeld Palace. It goes on like that for at least another whole page. The first Polish edition contained footnotes and a glossary of place names so that Polish readers could recognize in a passage like this their own Most Grunwaldski, Kostiul Szweti Wojciech, St. Adelbert, Adelbert's Church, on Platz Dominikanska, Ulice Witestwosza, and front to the Galleria Avangarda, all that remains of the Hatzfeld Palace. Far from pointless, such descriptions teach the Poles to remember the German city, to be aware of Ratzwaff as a palimpsest, and to read the text of the earlier city as it haunts that of the present city. Creating a sense of place for multiple narratives is also a key element in Olga Tokarczuk's House of Day, House of Night, which won the Gunter Grass Prize when it came out in an English translation by Antonia Lloyd-Jones. The narrator has moved to Novoruda, formerly German Neuroda, near the Czech border, and she strives to know it through the dislocated post-memories of the townspeople, shared notably by an elderly woman named Marta. Tokarczuk is a trained psychologist with a particular interest in Jungian theory. Recently, after the tragic plane accident that took the lives of many of Poland's leading politicians, including the president, you may remember this, they were on their way to a memorial in Russia um, for the Katyn massacre, a massacre of Polish soldiers, uh, which uh, had long been blamed on the Nazis, but uh, for which the Russians eventually took responsibility. Uh, she wrote a newspaper article about the Polish people's collective unconscious, arguing that the country needs to stop, quote, building its common identity around funeral marches and failed uprisings, end quote. She is generally interested in myths and symbols. It is no accident that House of Day opens with a section called The Dream, and in many ways the novel challenges romantic myths of Polish identity rooted in victimhood and doomed heroism, as well as the post-war myth of Poland reclaiming her Western territories, established by the communist government's efforts at Polonization. The title of the novel points us toward liminal space, between day and night, waking and dreaming. The novel inhabits other border zones as well, between history and myth, self and other, the known and the unknown or unknowable. In an interview translated and quoted by Dagmar Vienvoder Skinner, Tokarczuk observes, 
quote, there are regions that are doomed to be a permanent borderland between different cultures, even civilizations, and whose ha inhabitants stay close and distant to each other. It is not we who own the land, the land owns us. In a separate interview, she also states that she wants to live free from lies and falsification of history in Silesia. This appears to be in part the project of the narrator of House of Day. She moves into a house that she discovers is built over an underground stream. In wet weather, she struggles with water trying to seep into her foundation. Rather than a metaphor for instability, however, the insistent flow of the water becomes a metaphor for the openness to change and difference that the narrator embraces. Quote, the only thing I can be sure of is that I'm flowing through a point in space and time, and I'm nothing more than the sum of the properties of that space and time. The one advantage to emerge from this is that the world seen from a different viewpoint is a different world. So I can live in as many worlds as I am able to see. The narrator comes to see she indeed lives in many worlds. Instead of presenting a master narrative that determines the official history of the region, the novel presents a series of micro-narratives. Among the stories presented are those of Peter Dieter, a German tourist who visits his old village after the border is open between Poland and Germany, the Bobel family who arrive in the West from the East after the war and move into a house still inhabited by two German women, Polish treasure hunters committing Zabschaber who scour runes for German things left behind after the forced migration of the German population, and the von Goetzen family, who must leave their mansion for a new one bought cheaply in Bavaria before the war, after its owners have mysteriously departed. I suspect that they were Jews fleeing Nazi Germany. The sum of all these stories is that there is no exceptional suffering of Poles. Germans suffered too. And in order for the narrator to truly be at home in this new territory, she must come to know all the stories, which no matter how diverse, ultimately are shown to be deeply connected by time and place. The novel ends with the narrator's partner taking a series of night shots of the sky over time. Quote, R is certain that we'll have a set of stills showing a rational sequence of skies, which is sure to mean something. It'll be possible to put all the pictures together like a jigsaw, or to load them one on top of another in the computer or to make one single sky out of them with the help of a software program, and then we'll know. Similarly, we know this formerly German, now Polish land through the accretion of stories, multiple voices heard across time, as does the Polish narrator who comes to know herself through learning the land and its diverse stories. Despite the breaks in the historical continuity of Poland as a nation, the partitions, the Second World War, Polish art and culture has been in continuous existence and production. Stretching back to the Middle Ages, Polish art has existed as something of a border zone between Western and Eastern visual traditions. Jan Mateko of Krakow enjoyed a considerable international reputation in the late 19th century winning critical accolades and awards for his paintings that depict episodes from Polish history. In 1865, he won a gold medal at the Paris Salon for this painting, Skarga's Sermon, and, uh, at Mateko House, which is uh, now a museum in Krakow, uh, both his gold medal, you see on the far side there, uh, and here is his uh, uh, diploma from the Paris Salon of 1865. Modernists Henryk uh, Stavewski and Władysław Straminski were leading painters of the Polish avant-garde between the wars, working in a style of a geometric abstraction that was directly influenced by the Russian artists Kazimir Malevich and Vladimir Tatlin. And these are both examples from the National Art Museum in Wroclaw. After 1945 and the establishment of the PPR, Polish artists were required to work in the style of Stalinist social realism. However, the political warming in Poland that followed Stalin's death in 1953 and the events of 1956 fueled the ambitions and explorations of young Polish visual artists, some of whom were allowed for the first time since the establishment of the PPR to travel and exhibit internationally. 
One such artist was Magdalena Abikinovich, who today is one of the best known Polish artists of the 20th century, and who has forged an international reputation for fiber-based installation artworks that exist between the traditional disciplines of sculpture and painting. Born in Falenty in central Poland in 1930, Abikinovich studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw in the 1950s, becoming a professor of fine arts in Poznan in 1965, a position that she held until retiring from teaching in 1990. While many of her works typically defy categories of naturalism or abstraction, her alteration series is one where the use of the human figure allow us to interpret Abikinovich's art in relation to the war and the post-war history of Poland. The series, which began in 1974, conveys fear and anxiety, hurts and horrors, through multiple in-the-round headless figures of ranging numbers in installations that dispense with podiums and which rest directly on the floor. Some sit in chairs. Some sit on the floor, leaning forward, and some stand. Made of resin-soaked burlap, the surface of the figures appear wrinkled, emaciated, torn, and scarred, a fitting representation of living through the legacies of the immediate past and the drawn-out anxieties of the Cold War. Art historian Edmund Feldman describes, quote, by using organic materials that have the age, the capacity to age, wrinkle, and decay, and by placing the figures on the same floor as we stand on, Abakanovich draws us into their company, the company of the dead. Seeing sculpture becomes a funereal ritual, end quote. The alteration figures have a ghost-like presence that conjures up both the war dead and perhaps the living death of everyday life in a totalitarian regime. The headless groups in their drab and strictly organized uniformity can be interpreted as citizens living in a part of Europe where quite frankly the war didn't end in 1945. As I heard repeatedly on my trips to Poland, the war ended in 1989. Abikanovich writes, quote, since the end of the war, the war has continued here. Every day, I wake up frightened and uncertain about the future. The figures we see here seem to share her feelings. In the successive series, The Crowd, The Unrecognized, and Agora, Abakanovich increases the monumentality of alterations by casting these figures in bronze and eventually cast iron and sending them in permanent outdoor installations where the effects of daylight and weather simply add to the expressive power of their surfaces. These images show us the unrecognized, a permanent installation of 112 figures in Citadel Park in Poznan, which were installed in 2012. And as you can see, they are made of cast iron. The previous figures that we saw were all today in the National Museum of Art in Wroclaw, which has a considerable collection dedicated to Abikinovich. In a public space in front of Wroclaw's Opera House, we find three of her birds, Knowledge of Good and Evil, a series in aluminum. Like the alterations, as you can see, the birds are headless and are tightly grouped together, continuing Abikinovich's interest in crowding and anxiety. The birds have the power to fly, but lack the power to ponder reasons to fly. Today, Wroclaw is looking for reasons to fly. As we've seen after World War II, Poland worked aggressively to erase memories of the German past in the recovered territories. When Cardinal Wyszynski spoke in the Cathedral of Wroclaw in 1965 to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Polish church in the Western territories, he proclaimed, these stones, splendid heralds from the past say to us, we were here, yes, we were here and we are here again. We have returned to our paternal home. The message is clear to us. We understand it. We understand this language. It is our language. The stones call to us from the walls. The bones in the crypts covered in earth speak to us in our mother tongue. 
so much for the century's worth of voices for multi-ethnic inhabitants of the Bohemian and German cities on the same site. After the fall of communism, however, the city began to turn its attention to recuperating its multi-ethnic history. When the Dalai Lama was awarded honorary citizenship in 2008, the citation read, quote, Wrocław is a city of many cultures and religions. In the words of the late Pope John Paul II, Wrocław is a meeting place, a uniting place. The ideals of His Holiness the Dalai Lama are especially dear to the citizens of Wrocław, end quote. This notion of Ratzvaf as a meeting place, Miasto Spot Can, is central to the city's current identity and has spurred a number of projects of cultural exchange with Germany. In the four visits I've made to the city between 2008 and 2014, I've observed such events as a visiting show of German romantic paintings at the National Gallery and displays of designs by noted German architects of Breslau, such as Max Berg, in the Museum of Architecture. Ethnic cleansing in the 20th century may have left Wrocław a dominantly Polish Catholic city. However, a 2010 study by the Cities for Local Integration Policy Network, and this is a, a Europe-wide network of cities looking at how to uh, create multicultural spaces in their cities, indicates that the city is slowly regaining a multicultural identity. Some of this comes from the university which, like VIU, benefits from a healthy international student population, and from multinationals establishing offices and factories. Some of the larger ones are Korean and Italian. A population study identified minority communities of Ukrainians, Roma, Germans, Lemkos, these are an ethnic minority from the Carpathians, Jews, Tatars from the East, Karems, another ethnic minority, this time from Turkey, and Bulgarians. A good example of the desire in Wrocław to inhabit a cultural contact zone is the recently developed District of Mutual Respect, bordered by a Lutheran church, Jewish synagogue, Catholic church, and Orthodox church. Another uh, telling example would be the Jewish cemetery which was first included on the list of city monuments only in 1975. Established in 1856, the cemetery covers four and a half hectares and contains over 1,200 gravestones and is a testament to the city's German-Jewish history. It was closed in 1942 and in fact became a battleground during the Soviet siege. Smashed monuments and as you can see, bullet holes bear the evidence of the fighting which swept through the cemetery. In 1991, the cemetery became the Museum of Jewish Cemetery Art, a direct subsidiary of the City Museum of Wroclaw. The mix of ruins, trees, and ivy make the cemetery a place where the past and the present exist in a picturesque solemnity. Equally moving, and tied to efforts to reconcile with the city's multi-ethnic and past and post-war transformation is the Monument to Common Memory, which is in uh, Grabasinski Park. Designed in 2008 by Aloysius Grit, a professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in Wroclaw, the work marks the former site of a large cemetery that was converted into a park after 1945 and whose headstones had been collected and repurposed as raw building materials. The monument consists of a line of 12 feet foot tall granite blocks that approximate the appearance of a broken wall, into which are fixed a small number of headstones that were recovered and collected after 1989. Here we see the recovered gravestone of Erich Reitzig, a Breslauer who died in 1943, on which is inscribed UN Vergessen, unforgotten. At the entrance to the Monument to Common Memory, an inscription states, quote, you can tear down the cemetery, but you cannot destroy memory. In Wroclaw, despite conservative efforts, memories have indeed proven to be durable, even after their physical repositories have been vandalized or destroyed. Aloysius Grit's Memorial to Common Memory addresses such fragility by commemorating the historic destruction of cemeteries while partially restoring the once lost gravestones to their memorial function, one not merely of an individual, but now 
of a whole city. To conclude, the past, violent and painful as it is, is remembered, but not to generate resentments and division. Instead, through architecture, art, and stories from diverse perspectives, the different layers of the Palimpsestid as Vratsvaf can be read in order to learn the value of communities that celebrate diversity and the pleasures of blurred boundaries that promote transcultural connections. If you're interested in further reading, we have some suggestions. Here are uh, three useful historical works. Um, Norman Davies and Roger Morehouse's Microcosm is an interesting one. It was actually written uh, uh, as a commission. Uh, the mayor of Rotsfoff hired them to write a history of the city. Uh, he was a very forward-thinking fellow and a key mover in the development of Rotsfoff as the meeting place. Um, it is a massive uh, book, but well worth a read. Uh, just a note that uh, the uh, book is crit critiqued by some historians as being a little bit uh, too uh, favorable to the Polish side of things. Andrew Demschuk's The Lost German East um, is a very, really uh, recent and fascinating uh, look at the population shift. Uh, and in particular, he looks at the uh, German side. He, he looks at German people who were forced out of uh, their former homes and uh, interviews people, uh, reads in journals, diaries, letters, uh, and takes a kind of a different approach, uh, suggesting that uh, uh, for many of the people, much like the character Peter Dieter in House of Day, who comes to look at his old home, uh, that the, the lost Breslau and its surrounding areas um, exist no longer. The new, the new city has replaced it, and the home that they knew and loved is gone. Uh, Gregor Tum, you've heard Justin mention, Uprooted is an essential reading, I think, if you want to focus on the actual process of physical transformation of the city from a German city to a Polish city. Uh, it's well illustrated and uh, makes for some uh, fascinating and kind of horrifying in places reading. Um, as well, I've suggested some literary texts. These are ones that you've heard me mention. Uh, Stefan Havin's Death in Danzig um, was really, in some ways, like Death in Breslau, shocking when it came out, uh, because as I mentioned, the main character, Hahnemann, is a German, uh, and the focus is on his perspective, having his city invaded, having to share his home with a Polish family that moves in, uh, and uh, come to terms then with harassment from the Polish government after the war. Um, Marek Krajewski, I've, I've mentioned. Uh, Tomasz Ruzicki is a young Polish poet. Um, Colonies is a brilliant sonnet sequence. I highly recommend it. Uh, all of the poem titles uh, sound like, uh, well, like the collection title, but it's all about colonization. Uh, and yet the contents are all about the history of uh, his area of Poland and, and Poland more widely. Uh, he lives in Opola, which is not very far from Wrocław. Uh, Olga Tokarczuk I've mentioned, uh, Adam Zagajewski, in addition to a collection of poems by him, oops, I've skipped Wisława Szymborska, how can I, she's my favorite. <laughs> uh, that's a, a wonderful introduction to her work, the poems new and collected. Uh, it's a nice big fat piece that uh, gives you a good sense of the breadth of her career. Uh, she is a poet who is very deceptively simple. You'll read those poems and then they'll come back to, at you later on and you'll think about them and think about them some more. Uh, Tukarczuk I've mentioned. Adam Zagajewski, there is a, a good collection um, without end that includes to go to Lvov in it. Um, but I also thought I'd put here his uh, essay, Two Cities on Exile, History, and the imagination. Uh, this is an essay 
about the population transfers, about what it means to be forcibly moved uh, to a new place, about what it means to try and create an identity uh, and feel a sense of belonging in that new place. So these are a few things that are available in English. And of course, Eva Stachniak's novel, Necessary Lies, is published by Dundurn Press in Canada and is something that you can also access easily.